All right, this is episode nine of the series that I, Jeffrey Rickman, and he, TJ Owens. Hey, TJ, how you doing? We've been doing it on the Transbi- Transitional Book of Doctrines and Discipline. We are about halfway through the whole document. We're on episode 9, as I already said. We have made it through the doctrine. We have made it through the uh, social—not uh, principles, I always forget what they're called. We've made it through uh, the organization of committees and who has the different jobs in the church, and now we're going to continue going forward. We're in paragraph 350 on page, what is it, 46— We are... Yes, 46. Okay, page 46. We are going to be looking at um, organization of a new church, starting new church plants, transferring church affiliations, all these things that people care about, especially church plants. There are a lot of churches right now in the Global Methodist Church that do not have um, uh, a church building, but they have plenty of people who are interested. They might not even have clergy but they're interested in starting a new church. So this is pertaining to you, the the organization that they have. Now, before we get into it, um, I've been in conversations with Kara Nicholas, who is the chair of the Transitional Leadership Council. They're the primary leadership body of the Global Methodist Church. I've asked her questions about a lot of this stuff, and uh, the, the great stuff is a lot of the, um, the language here about being able to file a lien against the building or the church community whenever they don't um, pay unfunded pension liabilities. All of that language has been removed from the Transitional Book of Doctrines and Discipline. The frustrating thing is they're actually constantly amending the Transitional Book of Doctrines and Discipline, and so the version that we have may be out of date. I've put out a request to uh, Keith... um, the 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 primary coordinator of the GMC asking for a list of all of the amendments that have been made to this document. I haven't heard back from him yet, but um, hopefully at the end of this series we can come back and uh, change any language that that we've covered. So if if there this, is this is the one on their website, so it, they may have updated it and they didn't update the website. So they they are updating it. They're updating and putting a new version anytime they amend it. But unless you kn- have the previous oh, version memorized, you so don't know what they've changed it. We could have the stuff we go over today could change tomorrow, and unless we go back and look at it, we're not going to know. Right. Okay. Well, or stuff that we've covered could have already changed, right. and we don't even know about it because they're not publishing. Hey, here's some changes and errata that, that we've updated. So that's a frustrating thing. I understand that they they can't be perfect in all their ways, but it, it does seem like, hey, if you're going to change it, you need to let everybody know. So I'm reminded in, uh, in the Oklahoma Annual Conference, they changed the disaffiliation agreement several times, like four or five times, but they issued like no fanfare when they did it. So people using previous versions assumed that the conference was abiding by previous versions when, no, they published a new version, and that's the new standard. Now, the GMC, let's be fair, they're not looking to get people and and be disingenuous or anything. They just, they're making changes. You know, sometimes Keith puts an amendment to the TLC that they adopt. Sometimes it's an outside group, but um, they'll make changes and then publish the new version, but not say, hey, we changed this language here. Um... So that's just going to be a complicated thing about this this series. So if anything super substantial gets changed, you better believe we're going to be able to circle around and deal with it. So stick with this series through to the end. TJ, anything to be said before we dive in? I don't think so. We should get into it. Section 10. Okay. Uh, section, wait, what? Section, section 10. Yeah, the method of organizing a new church. Oh, that is a new yeah. section. I didn't even, okay, Paragraph very good. Paragraph 350. We're in paragraph 350. I'll I'll do the first reading, and then you can read for a bit. Paragraph 350, organization of a new church, point one. A new local church may be planted by any lay person or clergy person of the GMC with the consent of the bishop or presiding elder or district superintendent. So I underlined that part of consent of the bishop or presiding elder. Uh, Apparently, people can't be going around planting churches willy-nilly, they need to to be in touch with central coordination. Well, they can't plant a global Methodist church right off the bat. They can plant a church and then try to get it 
into the Global Methodist Church, right? Well, here it says, a new local church may be planted by any lay person or clergy person with the consent. So that says to me that they shouldn't even be starting on planting a community. I think what you just talked about is planting, just building it, and then trying to get it affiliated with the GMC. Right, yeah. That is not the assumed format. But what are they going to do? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, oh, you won't approve my church? I'll go back, go build another one. And uh, Let's finish this section and then talk about planting churches, because there is stuff to say. A sponsoring local church or group of local churches shall be the agent in charge of the project. In the absence of a sponsoring church, an annual conference, though it's desig- through its designated leadership, may assume the initiative. All right. Point two, each annual conference may determine the minimum number of members required for the chartering of a new local church. The bishop shall designate the district to which the new church shall belong. Point three, upon the request of the organizing pastor, the presiding elder or district superintendent, shall call the interested people to meet at an appointed time for the purpose of organizing them into a chartered local church, or may may by written authorization designate an elder in the district to call such a meeting. Following a time of worship, opportunity shall be given to those in attendance to present themselves for membership, whether by transfer or profession of faith. Upon organization, the new local church shall function under the provisions of the Transitional Book of Doctrines and Discipline. So, a lot of concern around church planting right now, because there are a lot of people interested in the GMC, but there might not be a building and there might not be clergy in charge. The good news is that laity can plant churches. They don't have to wait on um, clergy to be in place. But the bad news, in my opinion, is it still has to be centrally coordinated by a formal process, which I think actually stifles and intimidates what would otherwise be an organic process. So uh, as you understand church planting, does this seem like it looks intuitive, like it should work, or does it seem like maybe this isn't how church planting should work? Um, So you need to have some either clergy or layperson to head up the thing. It's got to be approved by the bishop or the district superintendent. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a sponsored local church. I don't think you have to... Well, if a local church isn't going to sponsor, then then the the annual annual conference conference does, yeah. So you've got to involve the annual conference Mm -hmm. or a sponsored church. Um, And then the annual conference has to determine the minimum number of members before it can even be a church. Right. Um, I don't know. It just seems like it seems like a process to do this. It seems like it would be easier just to start a church and then decide if you want to be global Methodist or not and then join that way. So the the thing I knew, I, and I might just do an independent segment on this, but we look at church planting as this highly formalized process that up until 100, 150 years ago, was not ever formalized. We started these mission agencies. Prior to mission agencies and church planting agencies, you would think you would have thought there were never any missions or new churches planted, and that was not the case. Before you formalize these things, believers used to just move to new areas and make believers wherever they went. They used to organize people around, well, in Methodist societies at least, there would be a new Methodist go to an area, and they would open their home to start hosting Bible studies and class meetings. And out of that, a new church community would get formed. They would eventually reach out to the denominational leadership, kind of similar to what you were assuming at first, which is that denominational leadership doesn't come in until there's something to present. Right, which makes... I mean, yeah, so if that's that's not the case and you actually want to plant a church Mm -hmm. as as a global Methodist... I guess this would be the process that you have to go about doing it then. If it's not going to be some organic thing, it's going to be some almost forced kind of thing, really. Well, forced, so I would say it's a formalized, organized process. They are, the GMC is contracting with the River Network, which is uh, training people to plant churches with the right culture in the right way. And so they want all of this to take place under the auspices of leadership rather than organically. But it's not just that the GMC from above is saying that they don't want this. 
so many laity coming out of the United Methodist Church do not even have the notion that they can plant a church. They feel like it's some highly technical thing that they're not equipped to do, so the GMC has to train them, has to formalize it, when the opposite is the case. And actually, you know, the, the wonderful thing about Methodism was we created methods for lots of things that are otherwise wild and and ungoverned. But the thing is, there are some things that are supposed to be wild or organic. I would use that yeah. word, just naturally occurring phenomena that, you know, I, I think it's, um, I guess the way I look at what's those Japanese trees called that, that they clip? Make them real small. Bonsai, right? Bonsai, yes. Okay, so I look at it as kind of like a bonsai tree where you got to plant it and it's growing out of control and then you got to start clipping parts. And that's what I understand the life of faith to be. And when you're planting a, a new church, let the Holy Spirit add growth and then clip those things and, and kind of uh, curtail it so as to make it beautiful and and bring it into conformity. Yeah. How are they, yeah, I guess it would be, how are they determining whether this someplace needs a new church? They're like, oh, there's... Not a whole lot of Methodists in this area, not a United Methodist Church, not a Global Methodist Church. There's a lot of people here. Let's put a church there. I'm sure they will eventually do that. For right now, what's happening is as disaffiliation has taken place all over the United States, there are a lot of regions where they've been able to take church buildings and assets with them, but there have been a lot of places where they haven't. And all of a sudden, you got a dozen, two, three, four dozen people that don't want to be a part of the UMC anymore but they want to be a church, right. and so they just need clergy to lead them. They need they they feel like they need a relationship with the GMC to to guide them in establishing a new church building, a new church culture, and so that's the immediate thing that they're dealing with. Once they've got all that settled, and people who want to be church communities have buildings and they're established, that's when I'm sure they will be looking at market forces and hey, we could plant a church here and it would probably do well. Okay. Okay. All right. If you uh, if you want to talk more about planting churches, that's something I'm I'm up for. I I want to train people to just do it themselves rather than. I hope it's not a threat to the GMC to have people just starting class meetings and home churches by themselves and then networking them with with the the network that's already there. I know that's not really what's described here, but I would like to think that there's room for such an approach. I guess we'll see. All right, let's go on to section 11, transfer of a local church. It was a pretty short section for something you would think would be pretty important. <laughs> I mean, I guess I don't know what else they would put in there, but uh, that surprises me that was a small section. Yeah. Um, anyways, 11. Well, this Trans- one is very uh, this is short as well. Short, yeah. yeah. Uh, transfer of a local church. A local church may be transferred from one annual conference to another by a two-thirds vote of the professing members who are present and voting in the church council and the church conference, and a simple majority vote by each of the two annual conferences involved. Upon announcement of of the required majorities by the bishop or bishops involved, the transfer shall immediately be effective. The votes required may originate in the local church or either of the annual conferences involved and shall be effective regardless of the order in which taken. In each of these action, in each case, an action shall remain effective unless and until rescinded prior, until rescinded prior to the completion of the transfer by a majority vote of those present and voting. It seems unnecessarily complicated. Well, it's a it's an odd situation where there's a local church that belongs to one annual conference, but they want to transfer to another annual conference. So when I read this, I was like, why would a local a GMC local church want to transfer, say, from the Heartland Annual Conference to say Mid Texas Annual Conference? That's kind of a close one. Or could a local church even transfer to the new Kenya Ethiopia Annual Conference? And it seems to me that that's what this is built around. And so the only scenario I could think of where a local church would want to do this is if they don't like the rate of connectional giving in their annual conference and they want to either give less or more. Uh, Or, you know, if they want to fund, yeah, I guess if you want to be kind of missional about it and you want to give directly to the Kenya-Ethiopia annual conference, hey, just let our church be a member there and we'll give into the coffers there. Yeah, or maybe like your uh, church is ethnically, you just like a... We're talking about Kenya, so uh, 
most of the people there are Kenyan and uh origination they just in the u.s for for whatever reason maybe they moved over here or oh yeah that's a good yeah in the heartland annual conference we actually have one church in canada that's a part of our annual conference and they are made up mostly of um i'm wanting to say nigerians the the two reps that came to our uh 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 starting annual conference what's <laughs> well, the <laughs> Not provisional. Pro, uh, no, it, it's not. It's, it's a. Uh, pe- we the, the the thing that we just had. Yeah. The yeah. Anyway, they came and they were they were not Canadian. I mean, they might be Canadian citizens, but they were not Canadian, uh, first generation Canadians. Huh. So they were immigrants. So anyway, yeah. Apparently, they're gonna allow for a a, a scenario where you can kind of have interwoven. Just because there's a local GMC at church in your area. What I'm surprised they don't talk about, you know how they talked about with membership, how an individual can have membership in two different church bodies, local churches. Uh-huh. They can have like affiliate membership right. or whatever. Kind of surprised they don't make a provision for local churches to have membership in two different annual conferences, but they don't talk about that. They just say, if you want to transfer to another annual conference, well, then you got to have a two-thirds vote of the professing members in the church council, and then your annual conference has to sign off on it, and their annual conference has to sign off on it, and right. then you can transfer. That just seems unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> like, if if the idea is the, the annual conference is made up of uh, churches that are close to each other geographically, mm-hmm. um, just stay in the annual conference. What? I, I don't know. I. If you've got a, a good excuse, l- let us hear it. But I don't really see one. I do. I do wonder. You know, all the leadership of the GMC has better things to do than be on a conference call with us just for fielding questions. But I do wonder if someone on the TLC could submit. Why? Why is this here? What's this for? I don't remember that section in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, but I wasn't the biggest. Student. Well, it, it just if if there's a, God forbid conflict like there is in the umc where you've got different jurisdictions fighting each other this could be like theoretically uh a way for some place in california that decided they didn't like the annual conference over there to join with, oh like, uh, so yeah I, the south or i don't want to like be that. tied to my annual conference we're going too crazy ideologically in this way i'm going to belong right. to the more solid um uh S- S- spain provisional yeah. conference. Okay, that's interesting. That's a good idea there, TJ. All right. We are now on section 12, shared ministry. This is paragraph 352 on cooperative parishes. A cooperative parish is a designated geographical area containing two or more local churches that have agreed to work together under unified parish leadership. The pastor and any other appointed clergy or a employed staff work as a unified ministry team. Each local church has its own church council, but there is also a parish council consisting of representatives from each local church council that governs uh, the coordinated efforts of the cooperative parish. There will also be a parish-wide pastor, parish, or staff parish relations committee. There may also be other parish-wide committees where financial support, property, or program ministry are shared parish-wide. The presiding elder, with the approval of the bishop, may form a cooperative parish in any suitable ministry setting with the consent of the local churches concerned. All right, that's all point one. Point two says the cabinet may organize cooperative parishes and may create appropriate policies and procedures as fits their ministry context. I think the cabinet is... uh, I think the cabinet would be the bishop and all the... Super, uh, uh, presiding elders. Point three, a cooperative parish or yoked parish may be formed with local churches of other denominations, provided that the doctrine and mission of the other denomination does not conflict with those of the global Methodist church. Such an ecumenical cooperative parish requires the approval of the appropriate judicatory body within which each local church is a member. So this is if there's a building that two different church communities both want to operate within. So in Oklahoma City, um, First Church hosts has the building, ownership of the building, but they also host another 
United Methodist community inside that building. And so how do you share that building? How do you share some of these assets? You have a parish committee that has representatives from both church communities in it. And so it's making provision for that, and it's also making provision for um, if a church community owns a building and another denominational local church also is in that building, how do they share? It's saying, you can share. You can have multiple church communities operating in a building. Here's what you need to have in place in order to do that. Okay, that's fine. I was trying to figure out why that would be, what the purpose of that would be, and I guess that, that makes sense. It ties into ecumenism, which broadly is you know cooperating with people outside of our tribe as much as possible. So the next section, paragraph 353, also deals with that. You want to read that? Mm, yeah. Okay. So 353, ecumenical, ecumenical congregations. One, definition. Ecumenical congregations may be formed by a local global Methodist church and one or more local congregations of other Christian traditions. Highlight that, other Christian traditions. Provided that the doctrine and missions of the other denomination does not conflict with those of the global Methodist church. Okay, that corrects the point that I was just going to, to make. Right, Very um, good. Such congregations are formed to enhance ministry, make wise stewardship of limited resources, and live out the ecumenical spirit in creative ways responsive to the needs of God's people, as well as to opportunities, as well as to opportunities for expanded mission and ministries. That just sounded weird to me. Forms of ecumenical shared ministries include a, a federated church in which one congregation is related to two or more denominations with persons choosing to hold membership in one or the other of the denominations, b, a union church in which a congregation with one unified membership role is related to two or more denominations, c, a merged church in which two or more congregations of different denominations form one congregation that relates to only one of the constituent, constituent denominations, d, a yoked parish in which congregations of different denominations share a pastor. See paragraph 353.3. Anything on uh, that first section that you highlighted? We're about to get to 353.3, so I guess that'll flesh it out a bit more. Okay. Okay. Two, covenanting. Congregations formed, uh, forming an ecumenical congregation shall develop a clear covenant of mission, a set of bylaws, or articles of agreement that address financial and property matters, church membership, denominational support and apportionments, committee structures and election procedures, terms and provisions of the pastorate, reporting procedures, relationships with apparent denom denominations, and matters related to amending or dissolving the agreement. Congregations shall notify the presiding elder of any amending of the covenant agreement and shall consult with the presiding elder prior to dissolving the covenant agreement. Nothing on that one? It's just, hey, you know, uh, my brother used to live in a house in Little Rock. He co-owned it with a buddy of his. You know, there was no marriage covenant or anything. It's just like, we're going to be co-owners, and they had to write up an agreement on how it was that that was going to work, how they were going to dissolve their ownership whenever it came time. So it's just anytime you're sharing assets, it's a, a wise thing to do. Yeah, write a contract, because if you don't have a contract, that, that that can get messy real quick. Yeah, everybody wants to imagine we're always going to get along, it's always going to go great. That's just not no. reality. No. Okay. Three, connectional responsibilities. Cabinets, conference staff, and other leaders shall work with the ecumenical congregations at their inception to maintain ongoing avenues of vital relationship and connection to the denominational church, while recognizing that such avenues must also be maintained with other denominational partners in that congregation. Okay. Anything else to be said about that one? Um, I, don't really, I don't really think so. Okay. I'm still not 100% clear on the <sighs> circumstances that would require an ecumenical congregation. So if, if we're serious, okay, one of the things that I think uh, to be a Methodist you really have to believe in is the Methodists are not the only ones who are saved. There is such a thing called the Church Catholic 
which is um, constituted by having true believers, true biblical believers. In that case, it should bother us that we are separated from others based on the name on our church building. And so ecumenism is, is a drive for Christian unity, letting non-essentials be secondary and focusing on the primary things with other believers who can do the same thing. So it, unfortunately, ecumenism got co-opted by liberalism, um, and you just they just started throwing out all Christian distinctives altogether. But the hope of ecumenism is we can actually undo a lot of the division that has taken place over the last two, three, four hundred years in the West and bind back together that which has been broken apart. I mean, it sounds good. Um, I, I wonder how many, like, what the percentage of churches in the Global Methodist or United Methodist are are like that, like two different denominations, like gathering in the same space. So I've heard of it in the United Methodist Church. In the Global Methodist Church, it's going to be rare, um, but whether or not it's going to be rare in five or ten years is a good question. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. That's the end of that section. It is, yeah. We're now to section 13, Congregational Fidelity. Paragraph 354, Congregational Fidelity. Central to the integrity of both local congregations and the Global Methodist Church as a whole, the doctrines and discipline of the denomination as outlined in the traditional book of doctrines and discipline shall be voluntarily and joyfully... on the front end if you're if you're if you're participating in the life of faith but you're begrudging about it or resentful about it you're doing it wrong you need to be joyful about it and if you're not joyful about it something's wrong we need to deal with that right now so i i like that it has this why should i be joyful this sounds like drudgery well no it shouldn't sound like drudgery to you it should like joyful obedience is a thing you know it's important not to tj no <laughs> I mean, like, if you're not enjoying it, don't do it. If you're not in, well, um, okay. So, in our articles of religion, no, no, it's in the um, the general rules. I forget what the explicit instruction is, but it uh, it says that we should trample underfoot that awful doctrine that we should do not not do good works unless we're happy to do it. I've kind of butchered the phrasing, but the notion is that the Christian standard is not that we wait till we feel good about it to do something, but that we insist that we do the right thing and we feel good about it at the same time. That's the Christian standard. Okay, fine. Trample underfoot that enthusiastic doctrine. I, I forget the exact language. I hope I remember to, to look it up later. But yeah, it's really important in the life of faith to insist that people not just do the right thing, but that they have the right feelings while they do it. Okay, no pushback. And so here, it's we have a shared covenant. Yes, it's not the Bible. However, it's going to determine our shared covenant. And as you are in shared covenant with other global Methodists, and you are a global Methodist, you voted to be a global Methodist, your church is global Methodist, then don't be a I begrudging member. On the vote. Say that again. So technically, I wasn't here on the vote. Well, I would have voted that way anyway. Yes. But. It's just to say, you are a member of a global Methodist congregation. You're not here to be dragging your feet and grumbling. You're here to be happy. And exactly, yeah, yeah, be happy. Be man, you know, you've had jobs when you have a job and everybody's complaining, it's very different than if you have a job and everybody's happy to be together, right? I, yeah, preferably everybody would be happy, but I don't know, that's not really the case. No, but <laughs> no, buts. 
it's always better when you have people who are happy to be there. It, that's like the, the, the number one, two, or three most important thing that employers look for in employees. They don't want employees that are gr- resentful and grumbling. It doesn't matter how good they are at their job. They want employees that are happy to be there and that joyfully work together. So it's just it's, – it's something where – we, we have like this dualistic notion of separating our bodies from our inner lives. And, hey, what's the difference if I'm doing the job? Who cares what I'm going through on the inside? And the answer is people can tell. Like you can tell when someone is not happy to be around you versus when someone is. And it's really important, like when you're around other people, when you're working with other people, that they know you're on board, you're invested, you're happy to be there with them. Uh, yeah, uh, you, and if and if they're not willing to, then like you have to facilitate. Man, are you sure you need to be here? They're paying me to be at a job. I'm doing my job. It doesn't but mean I'm happy about it. That's I a don't metaphor, really though, for, my, yeah. for the church, where if we church have a voluntary sure. organization that we're standing together against the gates of hell, but you got people grumbling all the way. I mean, the Bible talks about this in the Old and New Testament. Grumblers, mm mm mm. God does not like grumblers. Sure. And so uh, just on the front end, I mean, I wish they had the scriptural citations here to back it up, but it's just making very clear. If you're if you're not enjoying this, if you are not joyfully embracing this, then there's a conversation that needs to follow about if if you belong here or not, you know? Right on. Fair. Okay, yeah. JC, TJ thinks it's fine. Okay, let's go on. Additionally, local congregations covenant to provide connectional funding as set forth in paragraph 349. Yeah, don't forget about that money. Congregations that, for reason of conscience, find themselves unable to do so are accordingly encouraged to affiliate with another Christian denomination more in keeping with their beliefs or practices under paragraph 903. So don't let the door hit you on the way out, right? Yeah. It's a voluntary organization. Yeah. Okay. Should a congregation consistently advance doctrines or engage in practices not in conformity with the Transitional Book of Doctrines and Discipline or fail to remit in full the connectional funding set forth in paragraph 349, the Transitional Leadership Council or its successor shall have the authority to effectuate such a change independently, provided that the following provisions are met. So before we get into the provisions, it's um, prior... Okay, in the United Methodist Church, there was no... Mid, um, midstream governing body between general conferences or between annual conferences where they could kick people out. Here, the Transitional Leadership Committee, the intention is to maintain it in some uh, degree so that if, if there is a problem congregation, they don't have between the problem is identified and the next conference session to just poison the waters. Rather, you can just go ahead and act and get them out of the fellowship. Okay, so there's the Transitional Leadership Council or mm-hmm. whatever is going to be set down in stone right. at some point. What Does that map onto something from the UMC? That's not like the Council of Bishops. It's no, I don't think different. it maps on. I think it's a new thing. Okay, so it's not like that's one leadership body for all of them. There's I think not so. one for every annual conference. Well, the, so I think they do get into annual conference structures as well, but they're also maintaining... Uh, a top at the very top. Hey, if there is a big church that is teaching heresy or is making a big stink, stink financially, preferably all churches, whether they're big or small. Maybe so. Uh, the the you want to have the nuclear option for big churches that can take over an annual conference, though, because that's the reality. Like if you look at the Great Plains annual conference in the United Methodist Church, over half their income comes from Church of the Resurrection they are not going to kick out the Church of the Resurrection. It's just not going to happen. Right. But if there's a denominational body standing over them that doesn't care as much about that, they can still have the integrity. Oh, okay, to- so the, the, the annual conference is definitely not going to do it. And since these guys are not beholden it's technically to the annual conference's income, they can be like, we don't care. You're making a lot of money from these guys out. Yeah, ideally. Yeah. I mean, I, I, they don't say that, but that's what I assume. Yeah, that's a, hopefully the underlying um, implication of that rule. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get into the individual stipulations. Point one. 
If the current pastor of the congregation is promoting doctrines or practices contrary to those of the global Methodist Church, the bishop shall remove the pastor and appoint a pastor who will promote and defend the doctrines and practices of the GMC. The bishop shall then allow time for the new pastor to bring the congregation into conformity. So this speaks to an anxiety a lot of people have about bishops taking pastors away that they like. It is saying, hey, if your GMC pastor is not preaching GMC doctrine, yeah, we'll yank him or her and give you a new one. Okay. Um, but what's to say if the church is like, eh, no, you're not going to do that, we're out. So I think in that case... This would be the case if the... if I assume the annual conference or general conference planted the church maybe, and they don't own the assets, or they so, do own the assets. So there is no ownership of assets from the top. They're not even trustees uh, of the, the property, so the incentive structure has changed here. For all the churches that come in, but what what about one that's planted by the GMC specifically? Same, same. Okay. going to be locally owned, locally administered. There is no scenario where they get to say, all right, get out, it's our property now. Even if they pay for it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they're just not going to be doing this, going to court, uh, taking the assets, exigent circumstances. Rather, they're just going to involuntary dis- discontinue congregations and disaffiliate them. You- you'll see a lot more language pertaining to this. I'm curious as to how long that'll last, because if... Well, I mean, if you think about it, if, if an annual conference is playing, paying crazy amounts to like plant a local church in a big city or something mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. spending so much money on the uh, uh, property and the building and mm-hmm. all of this stuff. I feel like people are going to be reluctant to say, okay, this local, this, this pastor came in who's may have been good to begin with, but mm-hmm. they just took a, like a 180 and they're going mm-hmm. off the rails mm-hmm. um, and they're taking the congregation with them. Like right. how, how, Readier people are going to be to to say, ah, oh, darn that that sucks. So this Let is have it and go. this we are having a, a theology of church planting conflict with a theology of top down administration, where these two things may not fit together. In the United Methodist Church, they did have a, more control over local congregations. So there were several instances, even in Oklahoma, that I'm aware of where they planted a church, put a lot of time and energy and money into paying for it, equipping their clergy, and then the local church was like, we don't want to belong to the United Methodist Church. And then they went through a disaffiliation process. This was before 2553, where they would essentially have to buy their way out. So they would be tooting the horn of some church they planted for a couple of years, and then the church would be like, we want out, see you later. And they were able to recoup some of that money lost. Uh, I don't know if they were ever 100% or more. I really don't know because those are kind of like NDA uh, sort of things. But yeah, you're not going to be able to do that in the global Methodist church. So hypothetically, yeah, you're entirely right. They could dump tons of money into a church plant that then says, oh, we want to leave now, and you can't make us pay for anything. Either that or they'll be reluctant to actually pay for one to begin with. Well, and that's where I'm saying we need to re-examine our church planting approach here because right now it's very organization-based and very money-based. You know, we have this notion that it probably needs to be done by a clergy and we're going to have minimum salary standards. You probably have to have a certain standard of worship. You know, they put that in the mission statement. We worship boldly, worship extravagantly, I forget what the... But we are to be known by a certain standard of worship, apparently, and especially in a city ministry where you're planting something, there's going to be a certain class standard of, hey, you're going to need so much money to plant this thing right. Uh, I'm of the mind that that's a mistake, that you should only do that which is free and natural, and if it takes money to make it happen, then you're forcing it, and uh, you, you really shouldn't do it. I would, I would agree with that in a lot of, a lot of ways. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't anticipate that. Okay, well, let's... yeah. No, it, it, I mean everybody and their mom is planting churches <laughs> just because they like. Oh, this is a big city. There's a lot of a lot of people here that, and we need a non-denominational church or some kind of mm-hmm. church. So, like everybody's doing that. Why just let it happen naturally? Yeah, well, it's a or get it, a church. It's that's... definitely a class thing because okay, it, it ties into the worship style thing. 
if you're going to have a certain quality of contemporary music, you have to have a stage, a sound set up, all these instruments and musicians. It takes a lot of money to make that happen. If 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 you are if you're of the mind that in order to get city people into your church, you have to have a coffee bar and childcare and all these amenities that city people want, you're just not going to have that without throwing a bunch of money at it. So when you've got somebody like me saying, "Fine, don't plant those kinds of churches. Just do churches that cost no money and people show up not because there's all these amenities, but because they want Jesus and and you've got Jesus to offer." There are a lot of people I would say that to, and they would just go. Uh, no, that won't work. I don't even want to do that. Like, I'm not at all. There's so many people in GMC leadership who, if you had to put them in a place where there was no, none of those frills, none of those amenities, they wouldn't want to do it. If it was just like well, 20 not, people in a living room. So I'm not going to say, like, throw out the other one completely. If you want to do that, I'm not going to say don't do it. I mean, I think it's better if it's just naturally mm-hmm. occurring. Yeah, but. me too. I'm just saying the two are kind of mutual. They're two opposite models. One yeah, is authentic. Sure. You don't make it happen. The other is make it happen. Look at projection models, invest all this front end energy to to build something that will hopefully eventually sustain itself. Yeah. And I, and I think you're right. It's definitely like a class thing. Like the, um, for some reason in my head, Owasso is coming to, to mind and like all of these fairly wealthy people just dumping a bunch of money because well, we want a church over here that's that's ours. We don't want to travel so far to get to this church that doesn't have the nice fancy lights or something. I don't know why I'm we we, Owasso, we want but. it not just ours, but we want a certain quality here. Right. So we don't want it to be looking like a bunch of hicks. We want it to look like a professional production here. You know, uh, right? Which I that that hurts me because I'm I'm definitely more like okay, if you're gonna do it, do it, do it good, do it right. <laughs> Let's not. You're very much a quality person. (laughs) It's and you've seen a lot of cringy stuff, you know. And especially if you're doing like modern worship, if you don't do it excellently, it can get cringy really fast. Oh yeah. Yeah. So if you're going to do it, you got to do it well, and that requires a certain. Well, the other way around, if you're not, if you're, I mean, if you're just singing hymns, hymns, it can be, it can get bad real quick if you don't have a quality person up there. I don't think. I think it's harder to screw up hymns singing. Especially if it's acapella, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe because there's not as much stuff involved. If you've yeah, got a, there's a fewer terrible, moving parts, yeah, yeah, if you've got a terrible guitar player, piano player, that that, that alone can ruin the whole thing. So just if, sing acapella. Just, all you have to do is just say, "Hey, stop playing." <laughs> we'll sing. Yeah, we'll I, sing together. You know, you, you know, I'm. I've got a soft spot for the contemporary. I know you do. <laughs> I know you do, and I've masterfully moved it to the place where you've already agreed it's a class thing. So maybe not uh, a valid measure of whether or not a church community is good or should be sure. Planted. Yeah, no, you shouldn't. That shouldn't be the main determining factor. I don't. What think. if I say it shouldn't be a factor at all? I should back off. Let's um, let's yeah, okay. Let's let's, <laughs> let's 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 read point two. If step one proves unfruitful, or the pastor is not contributing to the problem, the bishop and presiding elder shall meet with the church council or its equivalent or a larger group of the congregation to identify areas of disagreement over the GMC doctrines or practices, seeking a resolution of such disagreements and restoration of conformity by the local church. The bishop shall winsomely defend and teach the doctrines and practices of the global Methodist church in such engagements. I think the winsome thing is just, bishop shouldn't be heavy-handed jerk about it. He should just, you know, be... You know, winsome is a great word. I'm not aware of another word that can be (laughs) supplemented. Interesting choice of words, yeah. Point three, if the local congregation fails to remit its connectional funding in full, as calculated annually, the presiding elder shall meet with the church council or its equivalent to encourage remittance. Point four, if a resolution of the disagreement proves unattainable, or the local church does not remit its connectional funding in full following the meeting with the presiding elder, the local church may involuntarily be involuntarily disaffiliated from the GMC by a two-thirds vote of the Transitional Leadership Council or its successor, by agreement of the bishop, and by an affirmative vote of the cabinet of the conference in which the local church is located. 
Point five, the congregation shall receive timely written notice of the involuntary disaffiliation and may appeal the decision to the Connectional Council on Appeals within 60 days, providing whatever explanations or other details to support their case. During the pendency of their appeal, the involuntary disaffiliation shall be stayed. The determination of the Connectional Council on Appeals shall be final. If no appeals occurs or if the involuntary disaffiliation is affirmed on appeal, the disaffiliation shall take effect immediately. And finally, point six, the provisions of paragraph 903, we haven't gotten there yet, regarding the fiduciary responsibility of the local congregation for its share of any unfended pension liability shall be met by the congregation prior to the release of any lien held by the GMC. Okay, so a congregation is not following the book of discipline or Mm -hmm. they're not paying their apportionments or whatever they call them in the GMC. Um, connectional giving. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, connectional funding. Um, the Transitional Leadership Council can approve to disaffiliate them. Involuntary yeah. disaffiliate them. Yeah. It's got to be the. It's got to be them. The bishops got to agree with it. Yeah. Sign off. Yeah. And then the annual conference has to vote on it. Um, it says it affirmative and. vote of the cabinet of the conference in which the local cho- Ooh, so so not even the whole conference the no, cabinet of the conference the cabinet, yeah. so like I don't know what the cabinet of the I think it would just be the would be right now the pre- presiding elders I think that's it so the bishop and the district superintendents yeah that's what it was in the United Methodist Church okay. I don't know why it would be any different in the global Methodist Church okay so basically okay. So the the incentive structure is completely different here. Before it used to be, if you don't abide by this stuff, we will change your pastor. Right. And if that doesn't work, we'll just close your church and take your stuff, kick you out, and then plant a new church there. But they can't do that now. So the point one here was, we'll change your clergy, but if they refuse to play ball and don't let their clergy go, yeah. then they might just involuntarily discontinue you. And that's an issue if it's... An issue with your clergy, and the second one's if it's an issue if the clergy is not responsible with it. It's the church council they meet with the church council, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's 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 a very it in the in the United Methodist Church. It's we're going to use money and power to coerce you. In the GMC, it's just we're not going to fellowship with you anymore. Yeah. We're not going to acknowledge. We're going to kick you out of our fellowship if you don't play ball, which I really like. It's just like the Southern Baptist Convention. Who did they just kick out? What's his face? Big mega church pastor. They do it like Rick Warren. Rick Warren. Yes. Oh, I they got kicked it. Kicked him out. Yeah, yeah. That's that's old news. Yeah, it's been it's been a little while. But yeah, it's, it's a big it, deal though. I I think that's the way that church power works. The coercive power of the UMC is inherently worldly, in my opinion. All sure. right. Yeah. Let's go on to section fourteen, transitional provisions. Go ahead, buddy. 355, the local congregations aligning with the Global Methodist Church. Number one, local congregations belonging to an annual conference that affiliates with the Global Methodist Church, paragraph 614, automatically are aligned with this denomination without the need to take a vote of the membership. Okay, what is that? Local congregations belonging to the annual conference that affiliates. So this is something that I'm pretty sure has been removed now. But remember, for a okay. while... If you could, like a, an annual conference all moves by its... Okay, so what it's saying, if, a, if an annual conference decides to go to the Global Methodist mm-hmm. Church, the local churches then don't have to take another vote right. to say, hey, we want to be part of the Global Methodist They're Church. They're all part of it. Yes, because they would technically mm-hmm. be taking the vote at That's, the annual conference. They all just that. come in as one huge block. Yeah. Okay, so then this isn't applicable any. Anymore, because they decided they couldn't do that. Right. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, By continuing to be part of their annual conference, the local church endorses the doctrinal standards of the and social witness, paragraphs 101 to 202, found in the Transitional Book of Doctrine and Discipline, and agrees to function under its authority and provisions. Local churches that desire to align with the United who with the United Methodist Church, or with a different Christian denomination may do so under the process established by the United Methodist Church. So yeah, the whole group was going to come over, but there would be some people who still want to belong to the UMC, 
So it's saying, hey, they can go. They can go to the UMC. They can, if they weren't done with the UMC, they don't have to follow the rest of their cohort, their old annual conference into the GMC. They can split off and go to the UMC. And assuming they have to make a church vote to do that. Whatever the UMC process is for joining. Okay. Since this is not applicable, do we even need to go over this whole paragraph? Is it necessary? I don't. I mean, I'm I'm reluctant to skip any. But no, you're right. It's it's not applicable. So we we probably have a better way to spend our yeah, time. Yeah. So if if for whatever reason there's an annual conference that decides to vote, I don't know. Say for whatever weird reason that happens, then you can go over this paragraph yourself. Yeah. And the 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 judicial council got involved in the United Methodist Church and just said. Annual conferences, this was such a crazy ruling. Well, this was after the central, well, I guess they're not annual conferences, they're the central conferences. The one in uh, Europe decided, oh, we're going to do it anyways. Yeah, well, that was illegal. Yeah. yeah. Well, according to, and they just couldn't enforce compliance yeah. because it's in a different country. But in the in the U.S., what the Judicial Council ruled was, technically, annual conferences do have the authority to do this, but because there's been no official process designed to do it, it's a moot it. point. Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's just so patently ridiculous. I, yeah. I will never miss the United Methodist Church. All right, well, okay, let's move on to part four now. We have now concluded part three on the local church. Now part four is the ministry of the Do cult. we want to get into this, or do we want to cut it short? 50 minutes. Okay. All right. Well, we're if gonna if we're going to cut it short, how about we have a closing reflection from TJ? Oh. And then, um, yeah, let's let's close out. We've we've concluded the whole section on the local church. Do you think that it was done well? Are there additional questions about how the local church is organized or should conduct itself? Uh, what do you say? Um, I mean, overall, I think it was. They they kind of know what they're doing. I mean, there's definitely parts of it that I, I wish would they would get rid of, like the the weird inclusive language that seems to be a holdover from the UMC. Was that in part? Three? Was in section section three? Okay. Yeah, because yeah, this is a I mean this is a long section. Yeah. Um. So yeah, all of that stuff that we went over with Spencer um was even I think the did we do a video with Robbie on this? No, no, that was, I don't that think was so. the yeah that was a different video. Um, that was the, what's his face in Kansas city, Adam yeah. Hamilton. Yeah. yeah. That was a good video. Yeah, go watch that video. Well, the, the thing I need to say, if, if, if viewers, if you do go and read the section that we are skipping at the end here, it does talk about filing a lien on the property. If local churches refuse to pay the, unpun- uh, uh, to pay the unfunded pension liabilities, this is an anxiety that, I mean, I, I've i reached out to Karen Nicholas about it because I thought, man, we cannot be having a situation in the GMC where churches want to leave and you're filing a lien on the building. First off, just an interesting legal thing, um, that is not the same thing as declaring exigent circumstances and taking all of the assets. If you file a lien on the property, it's just for the amount owed and things get liquidated and you can only take the amount owed. You can't take the whole kit and caboodle. So if you ever have a lien placed on your property for one reason or another, uh, you're not going to lose everything. You're just going to lose the amount. If a court finds that you owe, owe it, you're going to lose that amount. Um, but that's not a situation the GMC is going to be dealing with because the unfunded pension liabilities have already been paid to the UMC, and the pension program utilized by the GMC does not have the same – I think it's under the defined benefit plan. They're, they're not doing the same thing where these unfunded pension liabilities can accrue – and in order to leave, there's there's something to be paid. That That's not going to happen in the GMC. The, if you want to leave, you can leave for free. If they want to kick you out, there's nothing owed. They're just not going to be dealing with that scenario, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, it's helpful. I mean, because then you run into all other problems with lawsuits, and if you don't have to deal with lawsuits, then... Yeah, it's great. just it poisons the waters if the church leadership is spent in legal battles with coercive worldly power rather than... Uh, with spiritual battles against the forces of darkness and wickedness. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if you had a church body actually declaring war on the gates of hell, you know? All right. Anything else uh, to say about part three before we call it to a close? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Well, if you've enjoyed this series, then make sure to recommend it to a friend. I'm sorry for the frustration of... Uh, 
continued additions, but I, I do think it's good um, to talk through what's here and then to come and circle back around at the tail end uh, to any differences made. Um, one thing that I'm hoping is happening, we've got between 250 and 350 people watching this regularly on YouTube, and there are going to be other people who, who join up along the way. But coming to uh, next year's uh, general conference for the GMC, there needs to be much more familiarity with our shared covenant document as legislation is promoted and covered by me and other people. It's important that people know what it's about. They've thought through how and why they want to do things. For instance, in this episode, we talked about the theology of church planting and the theology of church authority and how these things do or don't work together and whether or not using firms and pumping a bunch of money into stuff um, is a good strategy or not. You know, this, this has culture and class implications. I'd like to think that other people are thinking through this, uh, not just in GMC leadership, but people on the grassroots level. Um, this is the time. We're still in the time to be re-examining our fundamental presuppositions. And if we can't do that, we're just going to do the same thing we've always done and get the same results. And I don't think anybody wants that. So use your thinker. Um, feel free to, to like and share uh, this and, and anything else pertaining to, to plain spoken, anything else that you find thoughtful or helpful in getting people moving in the right direction. If you want to support this effort TJ and I are doing, go to plainspoken.locals.com. That's where you can monetarily support us and you can have access to stuff that uh, we put out earlier than in other places or we'll generate content for there alone. Um, and is there anything else that I should plug before we... No, I was going to say you don't like – if you wanted to support us, you don't have to give a lot of money, like five bucks a month. Like that adds up after a while. We just bought a bunch of new equipment, and it's not it's not cheap. Like yeah. So – We've gotten a lot of love and support over yeah. the year or so that we've done this, and uh, we appreciate it. But a lot more is needed if we're going to – have much of an impact on the conversation. So if you think that we're good conversation partners, then uh, make sure to promote the, what we do. Keep us in the loop. Uh, we're at plainspokenpod at gmail.com if you well, want to email us. And one other thing, um, if you do support us and you want to like say, see something specific or give us like, ideas of what we need to cover, that's we, we take feedback. We want to hear what you want to see, what oh, you yeah. want to watch, what kind of stuff. So just keep that in mind if you give to us. Yeah, we always take locals much more seriously because people have to pay money to support right. us. So yes. if we hear from them, we know we have the, some skin in the game, and uh, so we take that real seriously. All right, well, let's let's cut this one off. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week on this series. God bless you.